Right, okay. Hopefully people can hear. Have I got uh Yeah, you're loud and clear, Mike. Okay, that's great. Um right. I think uh um Andy uh picking me up a bit there. But certainly I come to it from the, the hobby hobbyist point of view, but also working together with a lot of the businesses with understanding the needs that uh that people have. So uh is my screen showing correctly yes i think it is looking on the side there so yes. let's uh go ahead uh thank you i'm pleased to uh been asked to do a bit of presentation what i wanted to do was to i said originally i was going to do the things network five years on but i've decided doing the slides it's actually our things network that uh, i'm going to talk about so people might notice the strikeout uh didn't appear but uh it wasn't uh accidental uh, HTML in the uh, in the slide there. So a little bit about me first. Um, I grew up really initially when there were valves, high voltage valves, and uh, they were difficult things to play around with. But fortunately, transistors came along, and these devices encouraged me to learn about soldering and using strip board building my own projects at home, something I wouldn't have been allowed to do with the high voltage tubes, although I know lots of people did in workshops uh, after the war. I wasn't allowed to try the tubes because of the high voltages, but these projects with transistors, some of them scrounged from the local Texas Truman's plant that was just up the hill. And I also learned about Moore's Law, and that um, taught me that things were going to expand, but I never realized the impact they'd have on my uh, work life and my life. And other things changed. We had Teletypes 33s, where I entered code and created punch tape. Along came CD ROMs, they didn't last long. And now I do just in time learning, interactive tutor notebooks, YouTube tutorials, and Googling Stack Overflow for the solution to the error diagnosis. There were radio modules available for a few pounds that would communicate peer to peer over a few tens of meters. These were used in energy monitors such as current cost and open PRV projects that I got involved with. Or we could use by CO2 or Wi Fi modules, which, while more compatible with passive phones, had and still have a tricky stack of codes to make them work with ISA. So, why the Things Network? In November 2015, I went to a presentation at Reading Geek Night, where Mark Stanley talked about the project in Amsterdam. It started that July, following on from a team of creatives that had wirelessly wired. The city for under ten thousand pounds to support a one-off art project. Two guys called Finger and Johan were looking for a new project, and were so inspired by this story, they recreated it as an open source project with a crowdfunded plan to spread the technology, aiming to become the global network for IoT devices run by the community for the community. Mark was looking for people to help bring this tech to ready. My imagination was buzzing with access to the facilities of the local hack space that I was a member of, having recently completed the group 3D print the film project, all the pieces were in place to help. Myself and several others joined Mark to discuss the plan to set up the things that were ready, and later a brand called Figitude to support the linking of business and community with the the only compatible access points for the Things Network were available at a cost of around £600 for an in old one and a fifty back for an outdoor ready one. But several locals were prepared to buy one and host it. Hack space did so. Laura Wan had been available for a few years but hadn't paid it off. It wasn't seen as much of a product line of great interest to the distributors. Little were multi tech from a microchip. Semtech to know how the business would soar in the packets. 
Zoom, Reddit, and 12 things work network gateways and compliance. Covering the town centre, and in particular, this covers the railway line that run from London in all directions, north, west, and south. Reddit was the best public town in the UK. It didn't last long. Little did we know that others in London were also playing with the network, and when they discovered they could get a signal while travelling home to Oxford or Wales, they were spreading the word about Reading as a great test place. You might wonder why the things that were at still shows only those 12 gateways in Reading. I'll explain why the smart bar ones are not included a bit later. At the things conference hosted in Reading last October, Painter highlighted how few professional developers there are in the world. So it is interesting to note that the ratio of gateways to members has been consistently around 10 to 1 since the network started. And if only that 10% were active developers, then the CPN developer community is bigger than many ready companies. So we have So we had gateways, now we needed devices. Microchip had launched the first officially approved radio module. It happened that their UK headquarters is still ready with, at that time, a really approachable and inspiring marketing manager. Also, a team RS component sales engineer with close by, who would later go on to lead design spark. And then the chief engineer of the local bus company also got excited about the possibility. All helped us make the first device. It was a mobile tracker attached to an information to stop me and buy one tricycle. It caught the attention of the town mayor, as you see here, and also that of a concerned police officer, suspicious in the times of dodgy devices. Upon learning of what it actually was, he suggested a sticker saying CTM device that would assure others such as he in the future. The info tricycle was not only spreading the word about the network, but mapping the signal strength around the area at the same time. That mapping showed us that the things wanted to claim that distances for lower land from gateways were credible. It's not always achievable with indoor gateways, but we were impressed with the low power and the long range we could demonstrate. Our project. Our project at the Museum of Rural Life showed us the benefits of the things that work over Wi Fi. The building is next to the hospital. For whatever radio reason, the Wi Fi coverage is running, stretching mere feet from each access point. We used a Raspberry Pi to bridge the gateway for the Wi Fi, and then the gateway leaked to the raised bed growing sugar beet 100 meters away in the garden. Andy presented at the previous OSH Hub about the one wire temperature sensors. We use these together with moisture, light, and environmental sensors connected to a BBC microfib with a special microchip module built by a member of our hack space and the things that work with in ready. I supply now sell a similar shield to work that The only sensor that failed was the one that had tables to sever by a box digging the bed and did that twice. The first time it dug it up, they were new buried at the second managed to rip the building and pull it out. You know, that touches the things, the hazards of that outdoor activities. The project covered three years with different types of crops being studied over. Tra Traffic monitoring helped to show the council the ease of deploying the things that work device within existing equipment and the cost savings compared to using the alternatives. Another cost bus company chief engineer found temperature sensing a valuable and easy to deploy project. Unfortunately, he recently moved to a new job. I can't tell you where he's gone, but we have hope that the Oxford to Cambridge Railway will be using things network in the future. These projects do show the importance of having a team and interested contact in the company or authority. Connections with people is maybe more important than the connection between things. Before. 
We brought students on board with sponsored summer projects for the And we created challenges to use devices together with the things that work. And the great tech companies of the Thames Valley helped to make these things happen. Businesses sponsored workshops for their staff to learn about the opportunities enabled by the Things Network. SAGE, for instance, included staff from all their departments, from accounts to sales, development to management, and from Winnersh to Chicago. And although we didn't get to go to the US hackathon, they had learned enough from us to do that one for themselves. We ran a workshop for 16 artists with geeks, each learning from each other. The worthy winner, Kate, created a data-driven artwork visualising the flow of the River Thames using optic fibres and LEDs. Mark has always been driven to build a community, not a club. A smart city should involve and be shaped by everyone. At the same time, we were building trust and pushing the council to support borough-wide coverage. Many of the things that works started in Europe were enabled and funded by a local authority and the benefits of this was obvious. After two years of effort the council got funding for a council supported network and we are helping to roll out 80 gateways over four boroughs across Berkshire. The councils have sponsored eight projects which are underway using the connectivity for good community purposes. We call this network Smart Barks, and it's currently available for projects within the area and we'll link to the Things Network public as soon as it's available as appearing. I will describe that later. Other councils which have been doing similar things to Smart Barks include Tech Norfolk, floods in the Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, the Welsh Government, Newcastle, Calder Valley, we know that, and uh, which is Hebden Bridge, Glasgow, Camden, uh, which I mentioned just a few. There's a great 45 minute podcast in the IoT for All series, which you can find if you do Google Podcasts. Um, it records the history from the viewpoint of the Things Network founders, Venka and Johan. I'll put a link at the end. The, the podcast includes these useful topics. I don't know if you're, hopefully you're see, seeing that. Oh, right. So Laura, I pronounce it as in the girl's name, but other people say Laura, as in, it is a radio protocol. The L and the O come from low and long, and the R and the A for range. Uh, low power and long range are the two key features of the Things Network and of Laura Wan. It's low energy output, is also low energy input that is ideal for battery powered applications. Laura defines the frequencies that are used in the sub gigahertz license free industrial scientific and manufacturing band and also defines the encoding of the data on those waves. It can be implemented as a broadcast node or as peer to peer giving single channel asynchronous bi directional communication. And then LoRaWAN extends this concept to many hundreds of concurrent connections. Like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, it was created by an alliance of interested parties and companies. It has Im implemented on the access point. It uses multiple sets of channels with dual radios to manage communication with many of the nodes at the same time. The Things Network team, albeit that they were seen as hobbyists, had such a body of support in the industry and the community that the LoRaWAN Alliance had to bring them on board in spite of some initial reluctance. There is a great... So I feel the significant secret source of LoRaWAN is the chirp. Sending data through the air is not new, of course. Early on, simple on-off encoding was a method used for things like telegraph and Morse code. Then there was a technique called frequency shifting, 
which is shown to be more robust to noise and interference. Chirp is not new either. It spreads the data block over a range of frequencies and LoRa encodes the data for error correction and recovery. If you have an STR such as Lime or the RTL dongle, as Oshag ran a workshop on a while back, then you will be able to see the chirp in the waterfall display. You can learn all about the nitty gritty radio antennas and protocols by watching the excellent if very technical LoRa crash course by Thomas Telkamp on YouTube. I'll put a link up at the end. And for a great overview of where the Things Network and LoRaWAN fits into the wireless data more broadly, have a look at Richard Venner's two-part video, also available on YouTube. These, so on the left here, we see the end nodes, which are our devices. These link to the access point gateway, as um, we were showing, showing earlier. Concentrate, these concentrate the data on the Ethernet backhaul, which goes to the network server, although it can be on board. And then that passes on to the application server, the decoding and handling. Things Network support a public network for free. So for sustainability and revenue purposes, they created another business, the Things Industries, a commercial arm who support private instances of the network and sell other products and services. So how does it send data to the network? Well, the device broadcasts a message. The gateway will establish a link and attempt to forward the message. But not all LoRaWAN gateways are connected to the Things Network. Some are private only and some support multiple services. So how does it know which way to send it? Mark uses this metaphor that I like, showing the device address is like the sender. The application session, session key is like the destination and the network session key authority to use a particular network and to open the envelope at the other end. So see how this routing is actually handled within the ecosystem, the architecture. We have here the sender address going through and the decoding key being used at the end. You can, of course, add an extra layer of, of encoding within your packet of data within inside the envelope. And that was one of the things that could be used to address some of the concerns that were expressed about the keys. So let's have a look at a real device and how you might use it. It's mentioned that people might be interested in knowing a little bit about how you do it. So on a real device in our workshops, we use something called the Things Network Node. And you can buy that on RS components and elsewhere. It's not the cheapest device, but you could also put together your own using an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and a separate radio shield. The node has sensors, a button, and runs onto AA, AAA cells. It is supported within the Arduino with examples and uh, tested libraries, which is why we like it. Here we see the RN2483 chip with its metal can providing radio screening and the sealed module. It is a certified module and can be bought for around £10. It contains the Semtech proprietary radio chip and a controller which formed the equivalent of the old days where we used to have modems to connect to the internet. You might remember the sounds of with my best attempt at the sounds they used to make as we got connected at 56k or less. You send a message, a string of characters to the uh, port on the module and configure it. And then you pass the data to send and look for data that it receives back. Although the, although the module has a, a, pro, a processor on board, it's dedicated to running the module. And its firmware is part of the Euro LoRaWAN Alliance certification. So although you potentially could use it, it's not available for, for use uh, in an in a authorised way. It enforces the duty cycle restrictions that the ISM band requires, and it's the simplest device I've found to use. 
Install. The first thing you need to do is install an editor. Arduino ID is a simple option, but you could also use Visual Studio Code or another C++ IDE. I've used Arduino and Visual Studio Code with the platform IO extension installed. If you haven't looked at VS Code recently, then I would certainly suggest having a look at platform IO. It supports a wide range of microcontrollers and it's very broad and comprehensive in terms of doing it. If you need, you do also need to download the libraries for your device on the Things Network, uh, whether that's the IDE. But if you do it on platform IO, these are already included. And that's one of the great advantages if you're moving from having lots of uh, libraries that you're working with compared with simple code, which is fine on the Arduino. So we need to get the hardware info from the device. So the TTN node comes loaded with a script that provides it, but there is also a script in the examples. Here you can see getting the information from the LoRa uh, about the LoRaWAN spec. Now the spec has actually changed over the last few years, and some of the terminology has changed as well. Apparently the dev UI came from the IEEE address space. Uh, and it's used to identify the device. It's like that MAC address that was mentioned earlier, and is usually supplied by the device manufacturer. The join EUI, also known as the app EUI, mostly used, uh, called the app EUI in the Things Network documentation, is a global application ID for the in the IEEE address space, identifying the join server used. There are two methods of joining, uh, ABP and OTTA. Over the air um, allows uh, basically the exchange of keys from the server as part of the join process, whereas APB, ABP sorry, um, involves hard coding the certificate keys and the device process. Obviously, that is a potential place for key information to leak out. Let's go to the thingsnetwork.org, create an account, then you log in go to the console. Here you can manage your gateways on one tab and your application devices on the other. Devices are handled within the app, so the first task is to create the app. The app ID must be unique within TTN and there is a restricted character set. So look at using lowercase hyphens and underscores and numbers. Try to think of a format that you can use across your multiple devices that will make sense to you in terms of the naming, although there is a field for describing them further. So add your first device within your application. Look for the register link, which is on the right hand side of the page. It's just a little bit of text and isn't the most obvious tab, but that's how you do it to add your device. An app can have as many devices sending data on different port numbers to distinguish the data type. The device ID must be unique within TTN and cannot be changed. It says on in the box that you enter it, it's immutable. You should have got the device EUI from the script you ran on the device earlier. If you let it be generated, you can change it later, but it, you'll get a device denied on a join if it doesn't match the one on the device. The console will normally generate the app key and the EUI is inherited from the app. Load the example script. And then you'll see the copy of the keys from the console into the example. You get these in the, uh, so copy the keys from the console into the example script in your Arduino script, replacing the zeros placeholder that you see here and checking that the region's correct. We're in the EU and using EU 868. If you're in the US, you use 915. Japan and Australia are different again. The rest of the world mostly follows the US and the EU. On the TTN console, you can see the divide data per device, per app, and per gateway, if you happen to own one or be a collaborator or one. This data is in raw format, so you'll see it as a, as a series of hex characters. In the app page, we can see the payload tab and the default payload JavaScript example. We copy it from the Arduino example 
that's in the device and it, where it's commented out. So this matches the method that, of encoding that's in the script and has the, is the decoding equivalent. Copy it between the slash star and star slash, not using those, and replace the example in the console. You can test it with some raw data or use 0102 as shown in the example. You will then see clear data text for light, temperature, motion, etc. But that, this data is transient and will be lost when you close the console. So the next step is to send it somewhere for storage and displaying. TTM provides a screen of what they call integrations. You may be familiar with if, if this, then that for automated actions. And you will also see on the screen all things talk, my devices, things speak, and newbie dots all provide storage and dashboards and offer a free tier. If, in fact, you've got your own web server that can handle data, then an HTTP, HTTP option is your choice. Here you can send the data to your web server as a post and have it handled in whichever way you want. There is also Node-RED and MQTT options for collecting the data from the server. MQTT is a published subscribe service. One half runs on the TTM server and feeds data to your client, which you have to run on your own machine. It does need a constant connection, so it's not suitable for everybody if you're not on a permanent server on the internet. Example of using one of those services. So here's an example of one of those uh, dashboards. The all things, all things Talk Maker dashboard. You can show the dashboard here with graphs. It is as simple as that. So I said I'd mention what was going on in the near future, and here you see some of the things we heard about. And in fact, today there was a 24-hour Things Network virtual conference going on where they were talking about the new things coming with the V3 uh, backend, which is currently being tested in various places as it's rolled out. It will offer the public-private peering, which is something we will need for peering the Berkshire Smart Barks network with the public network and transferring data between the two. There's also a Colos co-localization service, which you may have seen with the integration. That's being enhanced with a new Semtec chip which will do a more sophisticated geolocation using a separate set of radios, including Wi-Fi. You can look at that one up. I only heard about it today. It will also be, as part of that, a time service, which will allow you to put a, a genuine time or a, a real-time uh, sync onto your node. Microchip had launched earlier this year a secure element service, which deals with some of the issues around handling keys and preventing you having to send all your keys to a manufacturer, mostly associated with bulk, bulk manufacturing. But for dealing with some of the issues mentioned before, then that is uh, one of the things. Lacuna have launched a satellite and are going to be launching more satellites, being uh, offering coverage uh, every 30 minutes or so, I think, once all their constellation is up. LoRa is being used at 2.4 gigs in boat projects. And I also heard today about wide, um, ultra wide band uh, width ways of perhaps imp uh, implementing LoRa to actually do away with the idea of having designated frequencies. Quite interesting. And the last one was radar style sensing using LoRa uh, like a radar device to actually map the area around it. So that's uh, the end of the bits and pieces. I've got these resources that are coming up. I'll post some of those up as I'm running short of time here, and then I'll put this slide up, which will have links to all the various things that I've talked about today. So thank you for listening. Hopefully I found that interesting and could hear it. I wasn't sure I got a note here to say that not all the audio was playing at the beginning of it. Hopefully it all made sense. Thanks very much, Mike. That was fantastic. Um, I have, are there any questions from Mike? As a reminder, uh, you can post questions using GoToWebinar, or you can stick your hand up, uh, or you can also send us questions on Twitter at BCSOSSG. Any questions for Mike?
Well, if anyone does have questions, they're more than welcome to contact myself. And I'm sure Mark will say the same, uh, either via Twitter there or one of the other channels, or visit our thingitude.com website and uh, send, send an email there. Um, and we're always happy to run always a workshop. Great. Thank you very much, Mike.